in the midst of such urgent, critical life and death need, there is still the question of what does it look like for me to show up as authentically myself? We need the creative thinkers and connectors who can figure out how do we have dialogue? How do we heal these rifts that have been in place for decades, if not centuries, between different people groups? There is still a place for creativity, for sensitivity, and for authenticity, even in the face of really perfect circumstances. Welcome, dear community, to this new episode on such a poignant topic as the world is alight with violence and genocide, and many are now calling not just for a ceasefire, but global ceasefire and for a full dismantling of empire. A million people took to the streets for a protest in London in solidarity with Palestine this past weekend, with many more who would have been supporting but were not able to make it, and so many protests around the world. It feels like we are in a turning point for humanity. I want to share these 10 remembrances for activists by Devon Blow. One, my voice matters in the fight for change. Two, every small step I take contributes to a larger movement. Three, I am empowered by my passion for justice and equality. Four, my actions inspire others to join the cause. Five, I am resilient in the face of challenges and setbacks. Six, together we have the power to create a better world. Seven, I embrace learning and growing through my activism. Eight, I am a catalyst for positive change in my community. Nine, my commitment to this cause is a source of strength. Ten, I believe in the power of unity to overcome obstacles. I also want to share with you this week a practice that Ebian Zanini, who you might know from the Style and Presence Summit, shared this past week. I mention it briefly in this conversation. And you may want to try it to anchor into your sacred activism. We did a version of this in my prayer circle for Diwali at the weekend, and it was really powerful. This practice is a way that you can enter into the unseen world to contribute to a more beautiful future through your meditation space. It's not the whole picture, but holding the vision in the spiritual realms of what is possible is part of sacred and visionary activism. These practices of intuition and visualization are not meant to just be used for the individual to make more money or whatever the coaching world sells as ideals, but for the collective. And this is how we decolonize the powers that are within us by turning this power that we have access to through our spiritual practices, through our connection with the earth and with each other and with the morphogenic fields into something that is for collective liberation and justice. We will be experimenting with this together in this month's Soul Space, which is our members' online gathering, happening on November the 22nd. And you can find out how to join through allthatweare.org forward slash support. You can start with this version that is based in Palestine and Israel, and then extend it into Sudan, the Congo, Haiti, Afghanistan, West Papua, and into any conflict, both global and in your local communities that you want to bring your sacred energy into. Ebian shares, in whatever way you weave your magic, petition for a ceasefire in the invisible realms. Ask for guidance, cloak the Palestinian people in love and protection, travel to the aggressors and their enablers, hold a mirror to them that they may remember their humanity. Envision a world where Palestinian and Israeli people live in peace, in freedom, in dignity, equally. Visualize a Palestine that is free, free of bombs, free of oppression and terrorists in any form, where there is peace, equality and safety, where the women sing under olive trees, where children have dreams and can grow up to live them. Visualize a Palestine that is free. 
Visualize an Israel that is free, free of indoctrination, free of supremacy, free of the colonial paradigm, free of the normalization of its government's violence and cruelty. Visualize a people that understand the historical crimes committed and negotiate for a peaceful and just solution. Visualize an Israel that recognizes Palestinian freedom and Jewish safety are not mutually exclusive, but codependent. Where there is peace, equality, and safety for all beings, visualize an Israel that is free. And this is something that you can add into your daily meditation practice. Some of you might already have a practice where you visualize part of your day unfolding. If you do my rituals for a beautiful day meditation that's on Insight Timer and those of you in the membership also have access to in the Rituals for Wellbeing, which is now being changed to Rituals for Life workshop, then you'll already be used to visualizing your day and visualizing the collective, but adding in any of the causes that you really feel connected to in this way into your daily practice so that you can really harness your spiritual energy for our collective liberation. My guest today is Dorcas Cheng Tozan, who is an award-winning writer, editor, speaker, and communications consultant. She is the author of three books, including the recent Social Justice for the Sensitive Soul, How to Change the World in Quiet Ways. Her work has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Christianity Today, Image Journal, and dozens of other publications in the US, Asia, and Africa. She serves as the editorial director of PAX, a Christian nonprofit dedicated to inspiring and equipping the next generation of Black, Indigenous, people of color, contemplative activists, and is a high school instructor of social innovation at Valley Christian Schools. Dorcas has nearly 20 years of experience as a nonprofit and social enterprise professional. She served as the first director of communications for D-Light, one of the world's leading social enterprises, and has provided communications consulting for social benefit companies around the world. A Silicon Valley native, she has lived in mainland China, Hong Kong, and Nairobi, Kenya. She and her entrepreneur husband have been married for 18 years and have two young sons. In this episode called The Path Forward, we explore the themes of authentic activism, burnout, and social justice as we speak to the question, how can we bring alive sustainable forms of activism that honor authenticity and humanity in each and every one of us? We hope that this conversation inspires you to connect deeper with how you can show up with the fullness of your heart in these times. Welcome to All That We Are, with me, your host, Amisha Gadiali. On this show, we explore the weave between activism, the sacred, creativity, and regeneration, the spaces where our inner and outer worlds dance. From healing trauma, to nature connection, to new technologies, to ancient wisdom, it's time for us to move beyond silos and into an integrated way of being. Every one of us has ideas and personal experiences to share that can lead us to a more beautiful future. Despite the challenges we face as a global community or the pressures we meet in our daily lives, when we stop and dare to listen, to ask ourselves the big questions and to share what we are already doing and envisioning, we create the futures of our wildest dreams and we begin to embody all that we are all that we are becoming, and all that is possible. Dorcas, it's a pleasure to welcome you to All That We Are. Your book was recommended by Jennifer Browdy, who is a longtime listener and part of this community, whose perspective uh, I really appreciate and the, the support that she has for women writers who are making this world more beautiful. Oh, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for having me. I'm really glad to be here today. What are the futures of your wildest dreams? What comes alive for you with that question? My hopes for the future are very much in line with Dr. Martin Luther King's vision of the beloved community, where individual people are 
treated with dignity and care and love, where we can not only accept one another, but truly embrace and celebrate one another for all the ways in which we are different and unique, even as we can connect with one another through our shared humanity. And I would love to see a world in which we can acknowledge the harm and the pain that we've done to one another, and that there can be reconciliation, there can be reparations, there can be forgiveness, and we can find new ways of being together, interacting with one another, and caring for and honoring one another. How do you feel that we can be creating that now? How are you creating that now? I think that a lot of it starts with ourselves, of ensuring that we are the healthiest versions of ourselves that we can be, that we are the best versions of ourselves that we can be, that we are grounded in um, in some form of spirituality or connection to something bigger than ourselves. And that from that, we can draw the strength to be someone who who doesn't just kind of respond to our, our, our baser instincts or that, that, that desire to win or to be the best, um, that it's not necessarily about our personal ambitions, but that it is about seeking the goodness of the whole, of the totality of, of humanity and, and this planet that we're on. So recently you've released a, a new body of work around social justice for the sensitive soul. I know that this question comes up a lot and it's something that we've explored here before is how do highly sensitive people show up in a world that is at crisis in so many ways where, yeah, there is so much going on and so many of the the traditional ways of being an activist are going out and being on the streets in big crowds or working on projects that might have you burning the midnight oil or the 3 a.m. oil yes. um, in order to, to make them happen. A lot of people that identify as being highly sensitive or empathic find that they can't do that or they can't do that for long periods of time. And so, yeah, I'm really curious to, for you to share more around how you see that people that are sensitive or um, highly empathic can bring their beauty into the beautiful future that we're co-creating. For individuals who are highly sensitive and highly empathic, and I would even say that there's a lot of overlap with individuals who are highly introverted, uh, I think first off is to recognize the unique and wonderful gifts that we bring, right? That ability to connect really deeply with other people, to resonate with the the suffering of others, um, to notice, to see what is often missed, right? To see who is not in the room, who is being left out of the conversation, who is being marginalized, who needs to be better included. I think the the gift of contemplation, of planning, of of care and wisdom, right? Those are all the gifts of of the highly sensitive and the highly empathic. So to recognize that and to lean into that, to not not shy away from that, not feel like you have to be that certain kind of activist, right? I think that's the model that we see most frequently in the news, online, even in the stories that we read. And the reality is that that is only a fraction of what activism is. And if you look throughout history, you have the major figures here and there, you know, Gandhi, Dr. King, Nelson Mandela, who were extraordinary individuals, extraordinary leaders, and yet their their work only had an impact because they were supported by thousands, tens of thousands of people who were faithfully being activists in their own places, in their own spaces, with their particular interests and gifts and talents. So I think that's really was my hope for writing this book, was an encouragement to people like myself, who are highly sensitive, highly empathic, that you don't have to be the person protesting in the streets or marching in the streets. Um, There are dozens, if not hundreds of ways in which you can participate in activism um, in ways that are authentic to who you are, 
that are um, meaningful and that actually are incredibly effective. So in the book, I give a number of examples like um, academic researchers, engineers who are creating the next technologies that are supporting people who have significant needs and the technology can improve their quality of life. I talk about documentarians and archivists of uh, just people who are really excellent at relationship building, mentors, teachers. We need everybody to do what they can with what they have um, in order to move toward a world where everybody is treated with dignity and equality. A lot of those examples that you've just given are professions. And so what about people that have a profession already or they are raising families or they are doing whatever they're doing in the world and they're moved by certain things that are happening and they want to also contribute to those? Yes. And I would say that's the vast majority of folks, right? It is a luxury to some extent to be able to be a full-time activist. But there, I think a lot of it is just keeping your eyes open for what are the opportunities around you in your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your school, in your own family. Are there conversations that you can have? Are there people you can connect with? It is absolutely worthwhile to just take the time to learn, to better understand about what is going on with a particular issue that you care about. Uh, I am a big advocate for experimentation in terms of discovering what it is that you want to do in the activist space. I don't think any of us just naturally know this is exactly what I want to do. This is exactly the issue that I want to work on. It, it takes some figuring out. And as part of that, it will involve some risk taking of maybe I, you know, drop by this organization and pick up a few pamphlets and talk to someone and learn more about what they do. Maybe I volunteer with this other organization for an hour. Maybe I just have a conversation with a friend who sees something in a different way than I do, and I want to better understand their perspective. One of my very favorite statistics that I came across when I was doing research was how Adam Grant, the organizational psychologist, he did a survey of more than 500 research studies. And these were all studies in which you had two individual people coming together, sitting face to face, not over Zoom, not over the phone, Uh, and just having a conversation. And these were two strangers from different backgrounds. So maybe they were from different ethnic backgrounds, different socioeconomic backgrounds. And it wasn't a conversation to debate or to win someone over to your side. It was just a conversation to get to know one another, to listen, to ask questions, to try to understand each other better. And in these conversations across 500 studies, 94% of the time, there was a reduction in prejudice. And so our willingness to simply engage with people and be kind and be a friend without preconditions of, you know, you have to agree with me 100% on all of these things for us to have a conversation, it can actually make a really significant difference. Um, And I am a parent myself of young children, and I certainly believe that um, those of us who interact with kids, with teens, with young adults, right, if you are a parent a mentor, a coach, a teacher, an aunt or an uncle, it is very much part of the work of justice to raise up the next generation of conscientious leaders and individuals who will do their best to ensure that all people are included and recognized and cared for, for the decades to come long before you and I, or long after you and I have passed on. Absolutely. And do you feel like being an activist in your own life, finding the ways in which you can embody the creation of the kind of world that you want to live in, do you feel like that's enough? Or there's also the fighting of the old system that is an important aspect of these times? Yeah. Can you clarify what you mean by the old system? spending a lot of energy on kind of creating the the ways that we want to live and putting our energy into what we feel is important so and it, as you said like raising the next generation in, in a way that might be quite different from a lot of the conditioned ideals of the current dominant system and so fighting the old it, it relates to the the dominant system that's 
that is in power in our world and colonial paradigms and all of it, the corporate interests, everything that creates the the actual societies in which we are living. Yes, I mean, very much so. I think in order for us to move toward what we hope will be a better future, we absolutely have to work toward dismantling the systems that have not been working, the systems that have clearly favored some groups over others, some countries over others, things that have been done in the past, the protesting, the marching, I, and continue today, right? The the canvassing, calling your elected representatives, those are effective. Those are important. There's absolutely a time and a place for them. And I would say that I would push us toward what are different ways that we can dismantle those systems, that we can challenge those systems that are also true to who we are as sensitive individuals. So one person that I have come to know and love simply through the process of writing this book is Sarah Corbett. She is the founder of the Craftivist Collective. She lives in London in yeah, the I've UK. Yes. And she's, um, she's lovely. And, and she and I had a, a wonderful conversation about how, you know, how do you engage with people in positions of power? Most typically, activists will come at people in power with quite a bit of energy, you know, so it could be an angry energy. It could be a frustrated energy. Um, it could just be a really strong energy in terms of trying to get them to change their mind or trying to get them to see things in a different way. And it's totally understandable. There's a lot to be angry about. There's a lot to be frustrated about. And at the same time, I think there's a challenge to us in how do we also empathize? You know, as much as we empathize with those who are suffering, those who are oppressed, those who are marginalized, what would it look like for us to also empathize with people who are in positions of power in that they are also human beings? So how do we speak to them as human beings with needs, with vulnerabilities, with fears. Um, so I, I love about Sarah's approach is it's all about gentle activism. And so how do we kind of appeal to the gentle, kind, compassionate parts of our soul that are in all of us? And, um, and so she really advocates for, for having very kind, respectful engagements with people in positions of power. And her Craftivist Collective has had quite a bit of success in doing that, right? In making beautiful art, in making personalized crafts, in having these uh, respectful, kind conversations, and, and as such, getting people to change their hearts. Another fantastic way of challenging systems is through knowledge, through research, through teaching, right? When we understand better, what are the actual issues we're facing? Who is being oppressed? What is causing the inequalities? And, and how can we begin to change it? Then that information is incredibly powerful. And it has been used to influence court cases. It's been used to influence policies. And it will continue to do so. And so I think that that people who who have that heart and that mind to desire to to understand and to dig really deep into unpacking these social issues that we're facing so that we not only know what are the root causes, but also begin to see a path forward. Individuals like that can make a huge difference in changing the way that our systems operate. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for bringing Sarah and Craftivism into it. I have really fond memories of encountering their work maybe 10, 15 years ago when I was in London and, and much more active in the kind of protesting space. And they would appear with these beautiful embroidered messages on, on huge pieces of cloth and, oh. and create this really beautiful talking piece. That's wonderful. How do you feel that in these times where we have so much coming at us through our phones and there's so much information that we're all receiving about so many different issues and there's also a pressure to know about everything every injustice that's happening in in the world this this kind of intellectual wars that can happen and and the whataboutism that comes up 
as this tool of white supremacy when somebody might be sharing about something that they're really moved by. And it's like, well, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? And why are you caring about that and not about this? And it can be like incredibly overwhelming. And one of the things that's that's really strong for me is is the remembrance that nobody knows like what your justifications are for doing something or what it is that's moving you to to show up for something and that it can be quite easy to get almost like freaked out of and not and worrying about doing the right thing and do it, getting it right and that that can then lead to complete kind of breakdown and in, in, in action and so for me it's really important that in these times we have a practice that that really grounds and roots us into our own being and part of that practice is around really keeping our hearts open and then trusting that impulse of where and how we want to show up i wonder what has come up for you in your own journey around the the, the overstimulation and um, the intense about amounts of information and causes that we're exposed to. Yes, it is real. <laughs> uh, you're certainly not the only one. I think we're all feeling that to some extent. If you think about it, it's really only been in the last 30 years, maybe, that we've had access to this much information that we can read about anything that is happening anywhere in the world at any moment. And I think the reality is that our brains are not wired to be able to manage that much stimulation, that much information, especially when it is hard to hear, right? When you are hearing about war and poverty and suffering and injustice, it is completely overwhelming. And so I do think that there is a lot to be said about making intentional choices not to let ourselves get overwhelmed. I think there, um, at least for me, it has been a journey of humility to some extent of recognizing that, you know, I think I used to want to be the person who could address every cause and do everything and speak up about everything. And I have come to the recognition that for one thing, I just physically and emotionally cannot bear that burden. It is far too overwhelming. And then secondly, I need to recognize that I'm not the only one in the fight, that there are so many others who are engaged and that when I need to step back, when I need to limit my engagement, when I need to focus my engagement, I just need to trust that there are going to be other people that step forward. Um, and I alone cannot bear the weight of the world. It doesn't make sense. And I certainly as one person can't do that much anyways. And so I have taken intentional steps to, for example, I don't read the news as voraciously as I used to. I actually am quite a bit of a news junkie, so I love reading the news, but I've really limited my news intake as of late. I think also, you know, recognizing that, that, that much of our mainstream news is designed in a way to get us riled up, right? So, so the focus is on primarily negative things, hard things, things that will make us angry, and so I used to, you know, list, start listening to the news first thing in the morning. Uh, National Public Radio is a big thing here in the U.S. And so I, I would listen to it, you know, f as soon as I woke up, up until all the way, you know, when I showed up at work a couple of hours later. And by the time I got to the office, I would already be completely overwhelmed <laughs> with all that was going on in the world. And so now I've made the intentional decision not to start my morning with the news. You know, I start my morning playing word games, <laughs> enjoying my breakfast. You know, like you were saying, those those practices that keep us grounded, that keep us in a good place. And I do still read the news, but I tend to scan the headlines and then maybe hone in on a few things of interest to me. I have limited how much news I listen to on the radio as well as watch over video because I've noticed that those tend to stimulate me more and get me more emotionally worked up. And I think just giving myself permission to let me focus on the couple of things that are really tugging on my heart right now. And, you know, I, I am a person of faith. And so I, in terms of my activism, I engage in a couple of things at a time, but then, you know, pray about a lot of other things, talk to people about a lot of other things. 
yeah, I think, I think it's that combination of keeping yourself humble, recognizing that other people can step in where you can't and giving yourself a lot of grace of, I will do what I can and it's okay that I have limitations and I can't do everything. I, I totally hear you and feel you. And just to ask this question, which you don't have to have an answer for, but I feel like it's a question that a lot of people that deeply care about these times find themselves asking. And if you were alive during the Holocaust or during a major genocide, what would you do? How would you show up? Of course, we find ourselves in this big world where there are so many horrendous things happening and we're, we're in this neo-colonial system and everyone's also trying to make a living and <laughs> trying to deal with late stage capitalism and all of the demands on their day. And if everyone kind of steps back thinking, okay, other people are doing it, other people are showing up, then potentially, you know, nothing might happen. And so I'm I'm curious of where I'm sure you've spent time <laughs> also contemplating this question of what is that balance between showing up because in a lot of the times that we've that we've heard about through our education or when we were kids, you know, like when I was told for example about the Holocaust at school and it it seemed like something that was impossible to ever happen again. And then we find ourselves watching videos of intense violence happening today. And then it's life and you go and get a coffee and you do this thing and you show up for this and you, you're on social media and you're in a warm, cozy home. And it's quite a lot, I feel, for, for us to process as humans. And of course, anyone that's, that is sitting there like, in a warm home, able to go and get a coffee and show up to work and is living in, in privilege in this world that we have. And so, yeah, it's an unclear, unformed question around how do we live in that dissonance? How do we live with an open heart, know that we are doing the best that we can, whilst also recognizing that we also have to show up to what's directly in front of us and be there for, you know, in your case, your kids or our co-workers or the environmental issue that's literally on our doorstep where we might have some flooding or something or a food shortage. And so I feel like there's a lot of pressure as humans at this time to navigate all of this. And for highly sensitive and empathic people, that heart desire to really show up. Yeah, it's it's challenging. Yes. And the reality is that people who are highly sensitive and empathic, I think we are always going to be drawn to these issues. What you're talking about, that that heart desire to show up, I, that's always going to be there. And so to some extent, I'm I'm leaning the other direction because I'm not really worried about people losing that fire, about losing that that desire of of your listeners are people who do care deeply, who are going to show up, who have probably already shown up over and over again. I think my encouragement is just how do we do it in a way that is sustainable? Because if we keep showing up over and over again, day in and day out for years on end, the studies are very clear that the average sort of lifespan of of someone who is of an activist engagement of an individual person is somewhere around five years um, because it is so intense. It's so, it requires so much emotional output as well as physical, you know, energy that, that most people are just exhausted after three to five years. And the way the activist space operates nowadays is that we tend to have such high expectations of one another and ourselves that you do have to be all in or else it doesn't matter at all what you do, right? You need to be, be in 24-7, 365 days a year. And if you take a weekend off, well, you know, that must mean that you don't care enough about, you know, what's going on in these other parts of the world or these other communities. And so I'm just encouraging that we find a little bit more balance in that. 
because we are burning through people so quickly. One of the things to really grieve in this is not only are are activists burning out, but they're burning out to the point where they're leaving activism altogether because they don't know. And I don't think we have really shown one another. How do you continue to be in this space in a way where not only are you giving and doing really meaningful work, but you're also feeling nourished and replenished and restored? So I think there's this kind of give and take this, you know, stepping in, stepping out. And so when I say step back, you know, I'm, um, my hope is not that people would step back forever and, and just hand it over to other people, but that it would be like that I am in a particularly intense time of my life. I'm raising young children or I have sick parents or relatives to care for. I'm financially in a hard place right now, right? Those are the moments where it totally makes sense. Like you, you need to be able to step back and you need to give yourself permission to do that. And then when you have a little bit more space, then please like come back in. Like we, we of course need you and we need your voice. And I think a huge part of it also, yeah, I mean, that exercise of, of what would any of us do when faced with a genocide and, and, you know, certainly it is a very pertinent question today. It also depends on, you know, where are you located geographically? Is it happening right in front of you? Is it happening next door? Is it happening, you know, um, a couple countries over? Is it on the other side of the world? And that may affect your ability to be part of the conversation and be part of the action. And yet I think even in the midst of such urgent critical life and death need, there is still the question of what does it look like for me to show up as authentically myself? You know, not all of us are going to be able to be like an Oscar Schindler or, you know, somebody who is doing incredibly dangerous, high-risk work to save others. There are some and, um, and they are incredible people and I am so grateful for their willingness to put their lives on the line for the sake of others. And then we also need people who will show up as artists, who will create the art that challenges us, that forces us to confront what is going on and gives us a a picture of how things could be different. We need the creative thinkers and connectors who can Uh, figure out how do we have dialogue? How do we heal these rifts that have been in place for decades, if not centuries, between different people groups? There is still a place for creativity, for sensitivity, and for authenticity, even in the face of really perfect circumstances. You know, one example that I really love is uh, what the Colombian government did, right? When, When they were fighting the FARC, and it was a conflict that had been going on for nearly 50 years. No end in sight. And what the government and the military decided to do was to bring in a marketing professional who essentially came up with really creative ad campaigns to convince the guerrillas to lay down their weapons and to come home and to seek peace. And what I love about it is that it was not only creative, unusual, unconventional, also completely nonviolent. It engaged a significant proportion of the population. It's not everyone's going to go and and fight or be a negotiator or a diplomat, but everyone can sign a soccer ball with a wish for peace that then um, the soccer balls were distributed all over the jungles where the gorillas were hiding out. And it was an invitation for them to come home. They would light up trees in the forest uh, at Christmas time that were motion activated. And so whenever somebody walked by, this 60 foot tree would light up with this huge written invitation of, you know, please come home, please join our communities again. And while, you know, Colombia is not a perfect country, there are still challenges, but for, I mean, that was a key um, strategy that ultimately led to a ceasefire between the FARC and the Colombian government. And so even when we talk about these big, massive things that are happening that feel like, you know, what can we do? What options do we have? I think that there are options. And I think 
It requires innovation. It requires thinking differently. And it requires an embracing of all of the different gifts and talents and perspectives that people will bring, whether they are sensitive or not. Beautiful. I love that example. And how that invitation to connect to our humanity, to everyone's humanity is so important in these times. Absolutely. My friend Ebyan Zanini, she offered a really beautiful practice this week for everyone that is present to the situation in the Middle East, which was to not just send prayers to everyone that is oppressed at this time, but also to really send prayers to those that are, that are in the role of the oppressor and with a mirror to remember their humanity. And so often we as humans in this kind of bigger system can be played as roles within a wider system. And the more that we can always root back to our humanity and to root back to everyone's humanity within all of it, then the more chance we have at creating something beautiful. Yes, absolutely. One of my favorite practices you know, it's been around for many, many years now, but, but a friend, you know, shared it with me a year or two ago, and it's been super helpful for me, especially in these difficult times where there is a lot of conflict, there is a lot of division, mistrust, is, is the practice of the loving kindness, meditation, loving kindness prayer. And that that is something you offer for yourself and for those you love, but also for those that you may be in conflict with, those that you don't just don't agree with. Like you said, those in maybe positions of power and influence, making decisions that seem to be causing a lot of harm, because I certainly don't want to lose sight of my own humanity in the midst of it. And I don't want to lose sight of theirs as well, because I do think that we only have hope of moving forward if we can hold on to that, whether we are on the same side of an issue or not. We are all human beings. We all have a lot of the same needs and desires and hopes. And so what would it look like for us to see that in everybody and to be able to engage with them in a way where that's that's what we are speaking to, right? We are speaking to their humanity as opposed to trying to force them or or bully them or or just pressure them into changing their minds. I, you know, I, that could be part of the approach, but, but I do think that ultimately we need to be able to recognize you and I, we are very much the same. And so how do we build a foundation upon those shared commonalities to move toward a resolution that is full of peace and, um, that is honoring for everybody involved. And of course, in which there is is justice and fairness and equity. Absolutely. And it's also recognizing that it doesn't mean that that's what's also going to unfold, at least not in a timeline that we might see. We all know this from personal conflicts that we've had or that we're experiencing, that even when you're like, ah, this is such a misunderstanding Mm -hmm. (laughs) and it doesn't need to be like this. Like this is like trauma meeting up against patterns and this is story rather than humanity. And this is someone doing something and not even realizing that it might have caused some harm. And, and then, you know, some people doing the flight and some people doing the fawn and some and all of this just kind of like coming into a crazy pattern of of chaos and and that this can happen that it can be really really difficult to create peace when both sides don't want it when both sides aren't ready for it when both sides don't have the the tools to come and meet each other in that way in that moment We can talk about the big wars, but I see that in personal relationships all the time. And I see that in the activist space, in the spiritual world, even when there's language and there are practices and frameworks and understanding of the shadow and of trauma, 
these things still arise. So it's also recognizing that as humans, we are so complicated and our interactions are so much more than we can see and perceive in the moment that really the main thing that we can do is is keep tuning back into our hearts and offering from that place whilst also acknowledging that that doesn't mean that we'll always be received in the way that mirrors actually the intention that we're putting out and that also boundaries are an important part in in everything as well. Very much so. The human struggle, right, on a sort of mini scale between two individuals or a small group of people just magnified over and over again is is what we see when we come up to these geopolitical challenges. But so much of it, I think, is about our ability to to work through our own stuff, right? To acknowledge our own shadows, our own traumas, our own triggers. How do we address that? How do we stay grounded? How do we let go of ego? And at least for, for someone like myself, and I think a lot of highly sensitive people struggle with perfectionism, struggle with people pleasing, and to be able to see with clarity what is the good and right and high integrity thing to do in this situation, even if it isn't perfect, even if it doesn't necessarily make everybody happy. Thank you for tuning in. If you are enjoying this episode, do join our membership. For a small contribution, you can be part of our community where we deepen the conversation and offer spaces of learning and embodiment. As a member, you are a patron supporting the making of this show, keeping the episodes full length, free and accessible for all. And you receive a number of benefits such as monthly soul space, going deeper sessions, access to our library of workshops and discounts on all our online and in-person experiences. Our membership is what makes us able to make this show and stay advertising free in a world that is always trying to sell us stuff we don't need. Head to allthatweare.org forward slash membership to find out more and join today. I would love for you to share your journey with the innovation in the startup world and your experience with your husband and the delight in this incredible project that has had such a huge impact in the world. And I would love for you to share a little bit of the behind the scenes of that journey. And just like how we've been talking about activism, the startup space and the social entrepreneur space, one that I've also been a part of is a space where we're really prone to burnout and that balance of creating something in the world that hasn't happened before and what it takes to have that vision, but to really see it through and bring something powerful into the world and then everything around it. The story of Delight begins at Stanford University. My husband, Najib Tozen, we had just got married. And then he went to business school at Stanford. And there he participated in a class called Design for Extreme Affordability through the design school at Stanford. And it's an interdisciplinary class between business students, engineering students, and they come together and work on projects that maybe could go on to be something else beyond the class. And so His business partner that he met there, his name is Sam Goldman. He had spent uh, four years with the United States Peace Corps in Benin in West Africa, lived in a tiny little village with no electricity, no running water. And it really struck him how awful and unjust it was that in the 21st century, there were still more than a billion people in the world using kerosene lanterns because they had no access to any form of reliable electricity. Sam actually went to business school with a desire to do something about that, met up with my husband, a few other engineers, and they came together. And it it was sort of the perfect timing, you know, so much if you've been in the startup world, 
so much of it is about being in the right place at the right time and, and a little bit of luck, right? <laughs> um, even if you have a great idea. And so it just so happened that around that time, 2007, 2008, LEDs were becoming very commonplace and much lower costs than they had previously been. Solar panels, the cost was going down significantly. There was a lot of new battery technology that was happening. And so it became more feasible for them to create these small solar powered lanterns that were exceptionally high quality. You know, these are little lanterns that need to survive monsoons and you know, being stepped on by animals and dirt and dust and, and bugs of daily life. And they could be extremely durable, but also really affordable. As such, they could be suitable replacements for kerosene lanterns. So since then, um, they have created a whole line of solar powered lights. The lowest cost one retails at four US dollars. And the the higher end ones, which provide more hours of light, also do mobile phone charging. Um, so that's in the range of 30 to $40. And then they have these home systems where it's a large solar panel that charges a larger battery that can then power multiple things. So it could charge your phone, it could charge a radio, even um, a flat screen television. Uh, their hope is really to elevate the quality of life for these families, many of whom are living in parts of the world where grid electricity is not going to come to them anytime soon. And so it makes sense for them to just go straight to solar, uh, where there's plenty of sunshine. It's a great natural, clean energy that they can use. Technology is such that, you know, batteries are very efficient. Solar panels are really efficient now. Um, and so you can create more and more um, devices that can be powered off of solar alone. And they've also innovated around because, you know, these are very low income families. And and so how can a low income family afford a solar system that is somewhere in the range of a few hundred dollars? And so they've um, pioneered a financing system that allows families to pay uh, a few pennies a day and ultimately pay off the entire cost of the system so that at the end of it, they own it and they're done and they don't have to make any further payments. But it makes it really affordable for them. It makes it very much within their reach and it completely transforms their lives. I mean, once you have access to electricity and all that that can power, children are able to study for longer hours at night. So their test scores improve. They go further in their education the adults are able to work for longer hours. They can keep their shops open for longer. They actually do better business because if you have a bright light in your shop, it attracts more customers. And so the their income goes up, their health and safety improves because kerosene lanterns, candles, fires, it's extraordinarily dangerous, as you can imagine, to have these burning in your home and it can lead to severe injuries or respiratory diseases or even a fire burning down your home. And so the outcomes that we have seen from these technologies has been remarkable. It's been incredibly encouraging. At this point, I think they're close to having reached about 130 million people with these products uh, who have now uh, moved off of kerosene and, and moved to solar powered light and solar powered uh, phone charging and radios and televisions and fans. But it has also been a very, very long, hard journey. Mm, yeah, I, I remember hearing about the D-Light, I guess maybe in around 2010, something like that, when I was working in the Impact Hub and so was surrounded by social entrepreneurs and exploring all of the incredible projects that were out there making a big impact. And so it's incredible what's happened. And I would now love to hear... <laughs> <laughs> the other side yes. of the story. The other side, <laughs> yes, yes, it has. Oh my goodness. I will say just personally. So I formally worked for the company for a couple of years, did consulting for Delight for a few more years. Even so, even though my involvement hasn't been quite as significant, it has always felt like a family venture because on a personal level, we have had to make almost every major family decision through the lens of delight for the last 15 years. So where we lived, we ended up moving overseas on three different occasions, living in China, Hong Kong, and Kenya twice. Because of the company, we delayed having children 
because of the company, pretty much every marital conflict that we ever had for over a decade was related to the business. But it's good to have somewhere to put the conflict. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. We can blame the business. Um, but it, it, yeah, serious ramifications for physical health as well as mental health. I got to a period of time where I was having severe panic attacks. I think I've always struggled with anxiety, but it sort of hit a new level in the middle of all of the delight stuff. And um, so now chronic anxiety is something that I live with every day. Um, And I I don't think it's ever going to go away. Um, It's now just a part of who I am. And we have, you know, lost friendships along the way, some in terms of just having drifted apart because we just didn't have time to see anybody we had some friends who used to work with us and then it got super awkward, you know, if things don't always work out. Uh, so there has been a lot of sacrifice along the way. There have been moments where I have been genuinely worried that my husband was shortening his lifespan by years, if not decades, by the amount of stress that he was enduring a lot of insomnia over the years, a lot of uh, stress eating and also not eating from stress, you know, like pretty much everything you can name, it all happened. Um, And so that question of, you know, was it worth it? I think so. (laughs) Um, Yes. And at the same time, You know, it's this weird thing where I think we only did it. We were only able to do it because we were young when we started. We were in our mid-20s when we started. Uh, We had a lot of energy. We were healthy at the time. (laughs) Um, And we were also extremely naive. And so if I had to do it over again, there were a lot of things that I would have done differently. At the same time, if we had known everything that was in store for us, we might have been too scared to actually go down that path. So it's sort of the not knowing that gave us the courage to to take the plunge um, and to take all the risks. And I think also recognizing that now we're in a different phase of life and we have little people that we're responsible for and older parents that we're responsible for. And, and so we don't have the same options that we had before. And, and so you just need to adapt with, um, as we were saying earlier, what you have in front of you, right? The other needs that you need to care for in your life, but it has been quite a journey. It has very much shaped and transformed the two of us and so many people we know and our entire family, but we've learned so much along the way. And it's certainly been an absolute privilege to, to be part of an adventure that has been able to make such an impact. Thank you for sharing with um, such openness and honesty. Uh, two of my most significant relationships have been with founders of social impact ventures so I have some idea of that journey yes and both of those relationships didn't last because of um well the the complete dedication to to that mission and the kind of casualties (laughs) that 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 happen in the way absolutely absolutely and you are not the only one I mean the rates of breakups and divorces among entrepreneurs is is really high. It's it's certainly higher than the general population because of the strain that it puts on relationships. And again, I feel like this is another of these complex, hard to answer questions. I'm just going to put it out there anyway for us to sure. explore. But the relationship between doing things in a way where you don't burn out and doing something that hasn't been done before And so now there's a huge amount of dialogue about balance and well-being and having tools so that you can do it all, you know, the work and the family and the personal life and have time off. What, What do you feel is possible within that reality I don't know that I think it's possible to have it all at the same time. Mm. Life is long. (laughs) Yes. There are chapters. Yes. It's been very helpful for me to think about the different seasons of life and to recognize that 
the level of commitment that I think most of us would hope for, right? That we can give toward our careers or our passions or our advocacy efforts or our children, our family. We're only one person. You can't give that level of commitment to everything all at once, right? It may be a couple of things at once. And so what is that one thing or are those two things that you want to focus on now? Understanding that there are going to be some sacrifices required in other spaces in your life. And also understanding that I don't think that commitment to those one or two things can last forever. Yes, there are going to be, there's maybe like a five year, a 10 year, even 15 year stretch where you are so committed to building up your business or so committed to this cause that you feel passionate about. And then recognizing that at some point, it probably makes sense for you to seek to to move on, I think, in terms of paying attention to the other important things in your life. And I would also say, at the same time, small choices go a long way. So in my previous work, I did a lot of writing and researching on, on marriage in the entrepreneurial space because that was a very personal topic for me. And I needed a lot of help in that area and came across the work of, of marriage researchers who, who talked about the magic six hours and how marriages or relationships can thrive if you dedicate six hours a week. And, and six hours very intentionally used, right? Not just the random six hours of sitting in front of a television together. Six hours in conversation. And it can be broken up into small little chunks of five-minute check-ins here and there, maybe a longer date night once a week. But all you need is the six hours a week. And that can sustain a relationship for for years. You know, I, I think it, it's great to have seasons where you can invest more time and the relationship, but those small intentional gestures really do mean a lot and can go a long way. And I would say the same thing with children, right? You may not be able to spend as much time with them as you would like, but to be really present with them when you can spend time with them. The the practices we've been talking about, right? Like a five minute practice, a 10 minute practice once a day. It it's huge. It makes so much more of a difference compared to not doing anything at all. And yet ultimately it doesn't take that much time, but it's very significant in, in your own grounding, in your self-awareness, in your own health. And so I, I think that's part of the balance of, of knowing there's only so much you can do at once, knowing that there are seasons and that it's healthy to kind of move around <laughs> in those seasons and, and to do different things over the course of your life. But then for what is important, you know, there are some things that you can't, you can't ignore your children for years on end. I do not recommend that at all. And so for the things that are important that you always want to make sure that you are paying attention to, to do that with intention and to to plan it, put it in your schedule, um, have that be a priority and to know that every little thing that you can give toward it, it matters and it counts. I think also most of life will be an imperfect juggling act and you do the best with what you have and and what you can. That's very helpful for so many people, what you've shared there. How did you recover from your burnouts? And you shared that you still have anxiety, that that's that's residual from the burnouts that you've had. How have you recognized when they have got to a point where you've had to really take action? And what are some of the things that you've done that you found really helpful? Well, I'll say that um, when I was younger, one of my biggest mistakes was that I didn't take action. There were plenty of signs and symptoms. Um, You know, I started having heart palpitations when I was, I think, 23 years old. And, you know, you're young. And so, I don't know, I think either I thought they were normal or they were no big deal. So just ignored it, just kept going. So I had heart palpitations, shortness of breath, um, very rapid heartbeat, insomnia. Those continue to be the signals that I pay attention to now. (laughs) But when I was young, I didn't pay attention to them. And so I, what I did was that I would get into the cycle of pretty much every two years, I would quit my job. So I worked in the NGO sector. 
for the first decade of my working career and loved what I did, loved the causes I worked for, loved the people I worked with, um, but it was just not at a sustainable pace. And so every two years, I would quit my job and I would start over again thinking that it was the job and that I just needed a change of environment. I needed to do something a little different. Sometimes that helped. Sometimes the environments weren't the best, um, but ultimately a lot of it was me <laughs> in terms of I had no boundaries. I could never say no to anyone. I based my identity on my achievements and accomplishments. So the more I did, the more I felt valued and the more important I felt. And without that, I didn't know who I was. So, so I just kept working and working and I've had two really, really awful burnouts in my life. One happened when I was 26 and then one happened when I was just about turning 30. And in both of those times, um, the burnout was accompanied by very severe depression and very severe anxiety. The first time I pretty much just was in bed for four months. Um, so both of these times I pushed myself, right? There were all these symptoms of burnout, the exhaustion, the fatigue, the sort of sense of so apathy and, and waking up and dreading going to work. And yet I would still do it. And so I pushed past that to the point where my body completely shut down. And so I could not get out of bed and just was in bed pretty much for four months. All I could do was eat, sleep, cry, and drag myself to see a therapist. <laughs> Those were my activities. So I had to quit my job, couldn't work for a number of months, and then and then went back to work and, and was trying to do things differently. Obviously didn't fully learn my lesson because four years later, I burned it again. And that was even worse. That was a depression that lasted, I think, over a year, probably close to a year and a half. Um, we were living overseas at the time, which made it challenging as well. It was such an awful dark time that I would never wish on anyone and I would never want to go through that again. And so that forced me to completely revamp how my life was ordered, how I thought about almost everything. I basically felt like my entire sense of identity was crumbled to dust and I had to rebuild myself from the ground up. So at that point I quit the NGO social enterprise work that I had been doing. It was the only career I had ever known. That's when I started getting into writing. Writing was extraordinarily healing for me. You know, a few years later we had kids and that sort of really brought it home to me that, that I could not work at the pace I previously had. It was no longer an option for me to work myself to the point of complete burnout because I, I had to remain functional for my kids. I could not get to the point of shutting down and no longer being available for my family. And plus the limitations of the anxiety that I have continued to live with. Um, so I've just had to put a lot more safeguards in place, a lot more boundaries in place. Um, therapy has been extraordinarily helpful. Um, I've also done EMDR, which has been really helpful for me in processing my anxiety, working through past traumas. I take anti-anxiety medication. That's been helpful as well. And, and leaning into quiet solitude practices, things, things that help me to stay grounded. I, I think also just cherishing friendships, relationships, which I did not prioritize before. I definitely put work before relationships before. Um, cherishing beauty and art and nature, all of those things. I think, um, you know, getting back to what we were saying earlier, those are the things that help me remember my own humanity. And the more connected I am with my own humanity, the better I'm able to see that humanity in others. Thank you. We've come full circle back to humanity. And I feel that so much that you've shared is an experience that many people can relate to. I'm sure many people listening have found themselves in those spaces. And there's often such a pressure to just be better. And I feel like that's 
part of the the issue with the the kind of wellness world, the wellness narrative, when we are in these systems where so many of our basic needs aren't met, like our real emotional and like sort of the time structure needs of of what what we actually need to be processing the amount of information that we are and living in the kind of pressured individualism that we're living in. And I feel just knowing that that you have been through what you've been through and that you have been able to find ways to share your experience in a way that it can make others not feel alone and and find their way out. It's something for me is that I experienced huge amounts of burnout when I was in the social entrepreneur world. And then I kind of, you know, had my recognition that I needed to make my spiritual life the center of my world and and do everything from that place. And then I went back into the social entrepreneur um, activism space and I was like, okay, I'm going to teach you all how to meditate and I'm going to, you know, and everyone was just <laughs> like, I haven't right. not got time for that. <laughs> and, you know, uh-huh. and then we find ourselves back in all of the same cycles. I feel like the way that the world is right now and what people are holding, because it does feel like everyone is holding a lot. And and part of that is also that you and I are sitting here in midlife and midlife is a time of huge amounts of responsibility, um, often coming from (laughs) so many different directions. Every direction, (laughs) yes. And very different needs that you're having to kind of step into a space of holding I've also spent a lot of time recently talking to much younger people than myself that are feeling a bit lost and unclear as to how how to find their way and and be of service and and earn their living and be part of a creation of something that feels meaningful to them and you know people I think of all generations are are finding elements of these times that we live in, yeah, just incredibly tough. And we talk so much about the mental health crisis and the rise in anxiety and depression and burnout. And I feel like there was a time, you know, 10 years ago where I was like, okay, you've done you've done my burnout. I've learned my tools. Okay, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, wouldn't that be lovely? <laughs> And just recognizing how complex it is and how it can, how it can keep creeping up. Yes, it is a perpetual thing to be aware of, at least for me, you know, it, as I said, it's a permanent part now of who I am. I did a survey of more than 200 highly sensitive and empathic people who had some interest in social justice and activism. And the vast majority of them, unsurprisingly, had burned out before. And what was surprising to me, though, was that of those who had burned out, I think something like two thirds of them had burned out five or more times. And so it sort of just shows that it takes us a while to learn these lessons and that it's something that we need to continually pay attention to. That no matter your age, your life stage, you could be 20 years old, you could be 80 years old and still be at risk for burnout. And this is so important because we need you, right? We need you and your unique gifts and your creativity, but you can only stay in the fight if, if you take care of yourself, if you are aware of what it is that you need to sustain yourself? When are the moments that maybe you just temporarily need to step back a little and breathe and sleep or get in touch again with your inner child or the beauty around you? We need you to um, be at at your best self so that you you can rejoin us when you're ready. That's also one thing I love about this idea of, you know, we're in it together. It's a community effort because none of us can do this alone. None of us can hold up um, ourselves, right? Like we need to hold up one another and encourage one another and and look out for each other of, you know, sometimes other people are better at seeing when we need to take a break than we are at seeing that ourselves, right? And so to to truly be there for one another and to be for 
one another in all that we do. And in all that we are. Yeah. There's something in there that that's also around recognizing that we might not always be able to be our best selves despite our best efforts. Sure, of course. And just acknowledging that we do live in a time of a lot of different like stress factors from the glyphosates in our food to the EMFs to there's so many different things in our environment that also is is affecting us and and so what we can do whatever we can do for our central nervous system is worth it and even if it doesn't get us to our best that that still to put in that effort and try and show up every day as grounded and rooted and spacious as we can. Mm -hmm. Yes, while also acknowledging that we are all works in progress and that that is perfectly okay. What is your call to action that you would like to leave us with? I would just love to invite people to a greater sense of grace for ourselves, for one another, that as you were saying, a lot of folks are feeling lost or unsure, not knowing how to show up, not knowing what to focus on. That is a normal part of the human condition. <laughs> Just know that you are not alone. You know, we are, as we've been saying, in our midlife. And I still feel like there is most of life that I have not yet figured out. And so to to give yourself grace to to try things without knowing how it's going to work out, to experiment, to talk to someone that you weren't expecting to talk to, um, and being open to what might be the surprises that come my way that I wasn't expecting, as well as, you know, who can I be more open to? Is there someone that I have kind of written off um, as somebody who I feel like doesn't care enough or isn't engaged enough, um, and I can offer them grace as well, just engage them in conversation, um, be their friend, see if there's something that we can do together. I think that in the midst of all that is going on in the world, a bit more gentleness and kindness toward ourselves and toward one another will go a really long way. And is there a an outer call to action as well that you'd like to share? I just want to refer back to what I was talking about earlier about how conversations, friendship can transform lives. And so we are becoming increasingly siloed. We are mainly choosing to just talk to people who are the same as us or who agree with us. And so I'd love to encourage us to, you know, have a conversation with someone who's really different from you or who maybe doesn't agree with you and just connect with them on a human level and, and to look for those commonalities, look for points of understanding of how, how can I better see where you are coming from such that we can find common ground and that we don't have to be antagonistic toward one another, but we can build a relationship that, I don't know, could become something. And and I think, again, that openness of what could this unexpected friendship become? And so I would just love to invite more of us to have face-to-face, one-on-one conversations with people we don't know or don't understand or don't agree with. Um, in hopes that we can learn a lot and and that both people in the conversation can can just grow as human beings. Beautiful. Thank you, Dorcas, and for everything that you have shared here. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. It's been so delightful. How would you like everyone listening to connect with you? Fortunately, I have a very unusual name. So if you just Google me, it's super easy to find me. Uh, But I do have a website, changchosen.com. And I'm on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. Those are probably the best places to find me. Um, And yes, please connect. I love hearing from folks. Uh, Love 
having conversations about justice and sensitivity and um, and even burnout and anxiety. Those are all topics that are very close to my heart. So please do reach out. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Thank you for listening. We hope that you have enjoyed this episode and it has sparked some inspiration and creativity in you. As always, you can find links to everything we mention in this episode, download our book and discover so much more over on allthatweare.org. We give space to our guests to share their perspective without debating it or fact-checking as this approach allows for deep, unedited conversations from the heart. We trust your discernment and wisdom to take what is useful and challenge what isn't in your own understanding. We offer spaces for discussion and integration in our membership community, which we would love for you to join. We don't believe in selling you things you don't need through this podcast, and so it's made possible by you, our beautiful community. If you loved this and would like to connect more deeply with us, please join our membership You choose what you contribute based on our sliding scale and you become a patron whose support makes this podcast happen as well as receiving access to a library of many resources and invitations to nourishing events. Please also hit subscribe and leave us a review wherever you listen so others can find us. This podcast is made by an all-female global team me, Amisha Gadiali, producer and host, Anna Gretta Folderbach, who crafts the words that accompany each episode, and Mary Chan, who edits the sound so skillfully. All That We Are celebrates all that we are already and the untapped potential that lives inside us. It invites the full power of the more than human world, nature, the unseen, our ancestors and our future generations. It reminds us that we never exist in silo, through borders, timelines, or polarity, that in each and every moment, all that we are is here.